Jesus and his disciples passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be the first must be last, and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable to you, our Lord and strength and Redeemer. Amen. Amen. So today we have an example of Jesus' disciples acting childish. Then Jesus tells them to model their lives after a little child. No wonder they're confused. It is not the first time that Jesus has hinted at the events to come as a way to prepare them. However, we are halfway through the gospel and at the halfway point of Jesus' journey to the cross. And he is acutely aware of the high stakes ahead. He clearly states what is going to happen. Depending on the translation, the disciples were exceedingly afraid mournful, grieved, or distressed after hearing the news. Church Father Chrysostom writes, if ignorant of the fact that Jesus must die at the hands of his Roman oppressors and religious collaborators, how could they be sorrowful? Because they were not altogether ignorant. They knew that he was soon to die, for they had been continually told about it. But just what this death might mean, they did not grasp clearly nor that there would be a speedy recognition of it from which innumerable blessings would flow. They did not see that there would be a resurrection. This is why they grieved. Not yet grasping the notion of resurrection, and of course not yet aware that the Holy Spirit would be sent to them in their apostleship when Jesus was gone, it is quite understandable that they would be anxious and afraid. And in a very human response, indeed a childish response, they jumped to an exercise in competitive banter about who was the greatest among them, perhaps an unconscious tactic to avoid dwelling on the reality of the harsh events to come. And I love how Jesus responds to all this, not with anger as in some recent scriptures we've read, but with tenderness, as if he didn't know, asks what the banter was all about. The disciples' silence spoke magnitudes, They knew they were being foolish. But Jesus lifts up the person on the lowest rung of the social Bible times ladder, a child, and says his famous line, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then with a natural gesture of genuine compassion, Jesus takes the child in his arms and says, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me but the one who sent me. So let's take a look at these last two phrases. Gregory of Nyssa wrote, the key mark of discipleship is servanthood. The text teaches that discipleship grows first by an inward movement as a tree seeking roots in order then to reach skyward. It becomes firmly planted before it shoots forth upwards towards heaven. So we too must be grounded in our understanding of servanthood before we know exactly what God is calling us to do at any given time in our lives. 
Christian educator, author, and activist Parker Palmer wrote, To Know as We Are Known, A Guide to Christian Spiritual Formation. He used the prayer practices of the Desert Fathers and Mothers to suggest the ideal teaching space. The Desert Fathers and Mothers were ascetics who lived outside the cities in the desert to devote themselves to a life of prayer. These characteristics we'll talk about are openness, boundaries, and hospitality. So we can create a space for openness when we remove impediments to learning both in the physical space and in our own minds. Jesus often reversed expectations to make his point, including this idea of becoming like a child in order to learn what is necessary to be a mature disciple. What was cluttering their mental space was this competitive spirit of whom was the greatest among them, as well as their avoidance tactics. And this is what was at the heart of the discussion they were being called out on in today's gospel. It was effectively brought it to light in Jesus' gentle rebuke, although it is not the last time Jesus will have to correct their behavior. Next, Parker Palmer addresses the need for boundaries. The spaciousness of the desert was made livable for the desert fathers and mothers by having a dwelling called a cave or a hut in which to do their prayer practice. They rested in the dwelling space of their silence so they could encounter the truth that was seeking them. I'll say that again. They rested in the dwelling space of their silence so that they could encounter the truth that was seeking them. These monastics felt that a certain level of discomfort defines the aesthetic life, in other words, extreme simplicity that allows the opening up of oneself to the truth. With boundaries firm, the divine spirit can do its work. So I love this idea that we rest in silence to encounter the truth that is seeking us. Don't we usually think of ourselves as seekers of the truth? When we add this deeper dimension of relationship with God in prayer, we recognize a paradox, that while we have sought out an isolated place and are alone when we pray, we are not really alone. It's like those sand tunnels we built at the ocean as children, two kids digging towards one another until they grasp hands in the middle, making a bridge. The two kids, of course, being ourselves and the divine spirit of God. In the Lord's Prayer, we say, give us today our daily bread which is a prayer for both the ability to provide nourishment for ourselves and others, but also for spiritual insight. God's desire is to give us insight. We need just to unclutter our minds and our hearts. When Parker Palmer uses the word truth in his book, he is referring to the truth of the gospel that Jesus came into the world to teach us. As we say in morning prayer, uh, prayer of St. Chrysostom. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. The third characteristic is hospitality, which is probably most relevant for today's gospel. Parker Palmer writes, hospitality means receiving each other, our struggles, our new ideas with openness and care. It means creating an ethos in which a community that is born of truth can form and the pain of truth's transformation, transformations can be born. I'll repeat that. It means creating an ethos in which a community that is born of truth can form and the pain of truth's transformations can be born. Looking back in time at the New Testament books following the Gospels, we see that the disciples have become confident and are preaching the good news, i.e. the truth far and wide, living out the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations as the resurrected Jesus asked them to do. Now let's look briefly at verse 37. Whoever welcomes one child in my name welcomes me. Jesus is perpetually plagued by people who are angry that he says he is the Son of God, even though he always points away from himself to God, especially by the Pharisees who did not see him as the Messiah they expected a military leader who would restore Israel, and the Romans ac accused Jesus of claiming him to be God and call that heresy and they, because they claim the Roman emperor to be God. So like children, the disciples are to see Jesus as the unexpected sort of Messiah that he is, a spiritual warrior who says, love your enemies, and believe and trust in him and in the extraordinary events that are happening around him. 
Welcoming the children, therefore, becomes a metaphor for the disciples and for us, for bringing our uncluttered minds to a learning situation, being willing to be still in a sacred space for the contemplation of spiritual truths to be revealed, and open to the possibility of seeing things in a more life-giving way. So while we have the light, let's believe in the light so that we can become children of light, as we read in John's Gospel. Let us strive to be children of light. I close with a prayer from a book called The Fragments of, ancient, of an Ancient Name by Joyce Rupp. She writes or has um, included somebody else's prayer for every day of the year, all of which are based on the different names for God. This is called light. You contain a tableau of possibilities, countless opportunities to encounter your indwelling gift of radiance, a glimmer of hope in depression, a ray of courage amid life's trials, a sparkle of joy at the end of an illness, a flash of valuable intu intuition, a beam of illuminating perception, a radiance only the stilled soul perceives and receives. Let us be aware of our inner light. Amen. you to stand as you are able. Together, let us confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, who suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please join me in the prayer to the people. Let us pray for the church and for the world. God of love, we pray for your church, for Michael, our presiding bishop, for Sean, our presiding bishop-elect, for Susan, our bishop, for all lay and ordained ministers, and for all who seek you in the community of the faithful. Equip us with compassion and love to carry out your work of reconciliation in the world. God of love, Hear our prayers for the church. God of freedom, we pray for our nation and all the nations of the world, for peace and unity across barriers of language, color, and creed, for elected and appointed leaders that they would serve the common good, inspire all people with courage to speak out against hatred, to actively resist evil, unite the human family in bonds of love, God of freedom, hear our prayers for the world. God of justice, we pray for the earth, 
your creation entrusted to our care. For the animals and birds, the mountains and oceans, and all parts of your creation that have no voice of their own. Stir up in us a thirst for justice that protects the earth and all its resources, that we may leave to our children's children the legacy of beauty and abundance that you have given us. God of justice, hear our prayers for the air. God of peace, we pray for this community, for our local leaders, for our schools and markets, for our neighborhoods and workplaces, for our friends and partners in outreach and mission. Kindle in every heart a desire for equality, respect, and opportunity for all. Give us courage to strive for justice and peace among all people, beginning here at home. God of peace, hear our prayers for this community. God of mercy, we pray for all in any kind of need or trouble for those whose lives are closely linked with ours and those connected to us as part of the human family, for refugees and prisoners, for the sick and suffering, the lonely and despairing, for those facing violence, for all held down by prejudice or injustice. Awaken in us compassion and humility of spirit as we seek and serve Christ in all persons. On this day, we pray especially for Liz and Jerry Landgraf, Jean Stewart, Joan Stewart, Karen Jackson, Britt McCarley, Greg Shutt, Casey Wagner and family as they travel the waterways of the world, Kenita Carter, Sarah Farmer, Aileen Hammers, Helen Plaisance, and Mary Kay Shell, and those we name at this time. God of mercy, hear our prayers for those who are in need. God of grace, we pray for those who have died, for the faithful in every generation who have worked for justice for prophets who called us to racial reconciliation, for martyrs who died because of hatred, and for all the community and communion of saints. Make us faithful to your call to proclaim your good news by word and example, and bring us at last into the glorious company of the saints in light. On this day, we pray especially for those who have died from the flooding in West and Central Africa. We pray for Thad Shelley. God of grace, hear our prayers for those who have died. Hear our prayers, holy God. Breathe your spirit over us and all the earth that barriers would crumble and division cease. Make us more fully your co-healers of the broken world. Unite us with all people in bonds of love that the whole earth and all its peoples may be at peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. My sisters, my brothers, my friends in Christ, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.